Hey, good morning and welcome to Cornerstone Alliance Online Church. My name is Joel Black and I'm the lead pastor here. Hey, did anyone else get a haircut this week? It's nice to see things are starting to get back uh, to normal. Things are slowly opening it up, up. And I think that's good. Slowly, day by day, little by little is the way to do it. Remember that social, social distancing rules are still in place, so please adhere to those. But by all means, get outside and enjoy this weather. Go for walks and do what you can. Hey, how was the, the trivia this morning? If you were able to sign in five minutes early, during the five minute countdown, we had uh, trivia this, this morning on names of the Bible. And I just want to remind you, there is still time for you to answer the trivia question from the Three Things Thursday email. If you're on the newsletter list, you would have got an email back then and there's one trivia question and you still have a chance to get your name put into that draw for a free Starbucks $5 gift card. The draw will happen on Facebook Live tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. So go back to your email and send me the answer uh, before then. Well, thanks for joining us this morning. We don't always know who's with us, so it'd be great if you can just uh, chat, say, hey, I'm here. Good morning. We love to see who's gathering with us this morning and, and uh, wherever you are in your living room or, or uh, in your bedroom or maybe in your cottage or wherever you are. Thanks for joining us. Please feel free to join in. Please feel free to chat uh, during the, the service. There's a Bible tab. There's also a notes tab for sermon notes and you'll also see some links in there that you might want to use later. And as always, there's a live prayer button down below and we will love to pray with you. So click on that, a private window pops up and let us pray with you even during the service. Uh, a couple of announcements I have for you. Uh, there is a, um, a raise, a hallelujah is happening for the third time. And this is a Christian and Missionary Alliance denomination, uh, countrywide international, uh, international prayer meeting that happens. And the next one is happening on Thursday. And so I don't have enough time to wait until Three Things Thursday email this week. I'm letting you know now, and I'll try to send out an email before then. Thursday at uh, one o'clock Eastern time, so that should be noon, right here, if you want to join that. Some of you have joined and said how wonderful it was. This is a powerful moment of hearing from emerging leaders as they share their challenges, hopes, and passions. So the invitation says, come and join us in this fresh call to audacious faith, daring risk, and radical dependence on Jesus. I want to remind you too, we have life groups that meet during the week. Presently, we're meeting on Monday evenings over Zoom conferencing, so please feel free to join one. Go to our website and click on the link. We have prayer meetings twice a week, Sunday morning, this morning at 9 to 9.30. A bunch of us met for prayer um, over video conferencing. And then Wednesday evenings uh, at 7 o'clock, there's about 10 to 12 of us that meet. We'd love to see 14 or 16 of us meeting together. So if you have time on Wednesday evening, uh, please join. Also, we have a COVID-19 resource page, lots of good things to help, or even ideas for how you can be helping others during this time. There's a COVID-19 uh, tab at the top. Please click on that. And, uh, and just want to remind you, uh, oh, thank you for subscribing to our YouTube channel. We have over 100 subscribers now. If you have not subscribed yet, uh, then please do so. There's two to three videos that are uploaded each week. And if you're not on Facebook, we put those same Facebook Live devotionals from our pastors onto YouTube. So that's a great way for you to see those uh, as well. Well, hey, as we begin this morning, as we begin our gathering with uh, other brothers and sisters here in Christ, I just want to encourage you to pause uh, for a moment. Uh, put down your coffee or your bowl of cereal uh, just for a second. And let's pause to be still. Breathe slowly and let's recenter our scattered minds on the presence of God, wherever you are. That may be, as I mentioned earlier, in your home, uh, perhaps it's in your cottage or in your trailer, wherever you are right now, let's pause just for a moment and focus on God's presence with us. As we draw near to you, God, would you draw near to us? Teach us more about you Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. May we know you more, more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly day by day. Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever sing.
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit. Washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all our day long. This is my story. This is my song. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. 
He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Something's coming. I can feel it. Something's always coming, I guess. Some kind of storm rolling in, always threatening. This looks like another big one. My dad always said, a man's gotta be ready for anything. You do the work, you hunker down, you take care of what's yours. A man don't run when the storm's coming. That's what he said. You be strong, you be the mountain, you don't move. <laughs> he was a mountain, all right. Then he was gone. Sometimes mountains fall. The storm hits. The waters come up fast. Mountains can crumble and slide right off into the sea. I've seen it happen. I'm no mountain. And I'm not standing out here on my own, Dad. I found something stronger. God is my refuge. I don't run away, but I do run to Him. He shows up every time. He helps when it gets bad. Maybe this storm will miss us. Maybe not. Let it come, whatever it is. I'm not afraid anymore. I'm not even gonna try to handle it on my own. I've seen what God can do. He is the storm sometimes. He's all the strength I need. He's the real mountain. I won't move as long as I'm with him. So I'm sticking with him, Dad. He is God. So this morning is the second sermon in the series uh, called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And this title is taken from a, a quote by a famous mentor and author who has since uh, recently passed away. And, um, and then recently another famous pastor and author has used that quote, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, uh, for the title of his new book, which I purchased not that long ago at Chapters. So when things do open up, you can maybe go there and buy that book. I, it's, a, it's a great read, but I want to use part of uh, one, one of the chapters in that book uh, to give you a history lesson right now, just as we start. Uh, just this is a brief history of speed, and you'll see why this is important as we get into the sermon for today. So have you ever thought of the history of speed or the history of time? Back in 200 BC, so a long time ago, people complained about this new technology and what it was doing and how it was wreaking havoc in their lives. What were they complaining about? They were complaining about the invention of the sundial. Here's a quote from a philosopher from many, many years ago. He says this, the gods confound the man who first found out how to distinguish hours. Confound him too, who in this place set up a sundial to cut and hack my days so wretchedly into small portions. You see, before that time, these philosophers were saying, I had an internal clock, I had a biological clock, and when I was hungry, if I had food, I could eat. And when the sun went down, I would go to sleep. And so I had these natural rhythms, but now time is, is, um, has become my master. And when it's time to eat, I'm supposed to eat whether I want to eat or not. And he says, though confound, God's confound the man who first invented this. And if we fast forward, obviously there's a mechanical clocks. Many old cities you can see in Europe have clock towers. Churches have, have clocks and bells that ring at certain times. So the clock uh, created for us this artificial time. We didn't always have uh, clocks and times and watches. And so when this happened, we stopped listening to our natural clocks. We stopped listening to our bodies and we started waking up to our alarms. That oppressive, you know, beep, 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 or the radio or whatever it is. It wasn't necessarily because we were done resting, but it was time to get up, of course, 
we became more efficient, yet some would say we also became a little more like machines and less uh, like a human being. One historian declared that this was like us declaring our independence from the sun. When the sun set our rhythms of work and rest, it did so under the control of God, our creator. But the clock is under the control of the employer who is a far more demanding master. So fast forward, 1879, Edison invented the light bulb. And now we can stay up after sunset. Before Edison, um, apparently, the average person slept, how many hours a night do you think the average person slept before we invented light bulbs? 11 hours. Wow, can you believe that? I think today, all research is showing that we are just not getting enough sleep. Maybe 11 hours isn't quite what we need. I mean, it might be more than we need, but still, we are under-sleeped, under-slept, aren't we, these days? It also used to be that a century ago, the less you worked, uh, the more status you had. You had leisure time to go sailing or to play tennis or, or to do whatever. But things have changed now, haven't they? It seems like today, the more you sit around and relax, the less status you have. Busyness has become a good thing, something to strive for. So many things to do, a long list of things. And so uh, advertisers um, play to that. They play to uh, business people wearing business clothes and suits and checking their watches and running from here to, with, here to there. And then uh, even more recently in Canada, um, Sundays used to be a no work day. And not even that, even in my lifetime, I remember stores were closed and shopping malls were closed and there wasn't a lot that you could do. Kind of like the last couple of months for us here in Canada now, things were shut down. And so whether for good or for bad, that has changed. And we were forced to rest. We were forced to take a break at least once a week. Um, but now things have changed. And so I remember, maybe you remember too, uh, different traditions you might have had in your family. And this wasn't Christian or not, it was just everyone. Uh, but in our family, we, we were forced to take a nap uh, <laughs> Sunday afternoons. Even if I wasn't even tired, I'd lie in my bed and just like try to sleep. Um, because things were going, hockey games didn't happen. But slowly those things changed. And anyways, all of this sped up. And then recently, 2007, was a big year for us. Some people say that when history books are written, the year 2007 will go down in history as on par with 1440. Do you remember what happened in the year 1440? This was the year the printing press was invented, which changed everything, which changed how things were published, how news, how everything was disseminated. So what happened in 2007? Steve Jobs released the iPhone into the wild that year. Not only that, though, um, a few months prior to that, Facebook opened up to anyone with an email address. There was this microblogging app called Twitter that became its own platform. This was the first year of the cloud, the app store. Intel switched from uh, silicon to metal ch chips, and there was a whole long list of other technological breakthroughs. It's hard today for many of us to remember what life was like before we had a smartphone, or even Wi-Fi access, but it was not that long ago. Now I can't even imagine uh, living without something that didn't even exist, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. This was so recent. Recently, our washing machine broke and we had to get, recently, I mean, the last few days, and the repair was basically half the price of what a new one would have been. And so an 11 year old washing machine, you pay half price uh, to get it fixed and it maybe will break again. So we decided to buy a new washing machine, and guess what? It has Wi-Fi on our new washing machine. I have no idea what we would use it for, but it says we've kind of come to expect uh, Wi-Fi on everywhere and everything, and that wasn't even around that long ago. The internet alone has changed the world, and not always for the good. Some people say that the internet is decreasing our IQs, or at least our capacity to pay attention. A uh, recent study found that the average iPhone user, and I don't think it's different for Android users, but this study was for iPhone users, uh, 
the average iPhone users, user touches their phone 2,167 times each day for about two and a half hours every day. Another study has shown that just being in the same room as our phones, even if the phone is turned off, will reduce our working memory and problem solving skills. In other words, these things are making us dumber, according to lots of research. So touching your phone every now and then, I'm just going to see uh, who liked my foot, my post. Is there something new on Instagram? Just a little, you know, just a couple seconds and then put it down. A few minutes later, oh, just again and put it down. It's not really a big deal. But listen to this. Slot machines, you know, in casinos, um, they bring in more money than film industry and Major League Baseball combined because it's addictive and it's just one quarter, you know, just 25 cents at a time, a little bit. It's not much, it's nothing, a little by little. But those small amounts, they might seem that they don't matter, but it adds up over time. And it's the same with our phones. Oh, just a little bit here, just a little bit there. It adds up. A quick scroll, a little, you know, scan at our email, it adds up to an enormous amount of time. Now, have you heard of Sean Parker? No relation to Peter, as far as I know, but Sean Parker was the first president of Facebook. If you've seen the movie about Facebook, he's the, Justin Timberlake portrays him uh, in the movie. So Sean Parker is now a conscientious objector of social media. I know that might be easy for him to say he's made billions of dollars off this industry, but he says that the social networking site, not just Facebook, but social networking sites in general, um, exploit human psychological vulnerabilities through this validation feedback loop that gets people to constantly post to get even more likes and comments. He says, it's exactly the kind of thing that a hacker like myself would come up with. Uh, because you're exploiting a vulnerability in human psychology. Parker says that the thought process when building Facebook was to figure out how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible. Hey, do you remember Flappy Bird? There was that really popular game. It was really hard, had to, quite difficult, but at the end of January 2014, did you know it was the most downloaded, downloaded free game in the App Store? And during this period, its developers said that Flappy Bird was bringing in $50,000 a day in ad revenue. Well, one month later, in February of 2014, Flappy Bird was removed from the App Store by its creator. He says he felt guilty over what he considered to be its addictive nature and overuse. Have you ever heard of any other people stepping down or, or taking things out of the App Store because of their conscience? Well, research tells us that our attention span is dropping every year, year by year. In 2000, research says that before the digital revolution, right, can you imagine what was it like 20 years ago? Not, no one had smartphones, right? Before the digital revo revolution, our attention span was 12 seconds. And so that doesn't seem very long to begin with. But since then, uh, we are, it's now down to eight seconds. And just to put that in perspective, goldfish have an attention span of nine seconds. <laughs> so we're losing the goldfish, okay? So this new speed of life, it isn't Christian. In fact, this new speed of life, life is anti-Christ. I mean, think about it. What was the core of Jesus' teachings? What did he say summed up the entire Bible? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. Love God and love your neighbor right, as yourself. But here's the problem. Hurry and love are incompatible. If we're in a, a hurry, our ability to love someone is significantly decreased. Just think of all the ways that you can show love to someone. Complimenting them, um, listening to them, praying for them. All of these things take time, don't they? And so if we're in a hurry, how are we able to love other people? This is the problem. Hurry and love are like oil 
and water. They don't mesh well. Hurry and love are incompatible. Let me give you an example of how hurry and love don't go together from my own life. When we were living in Japan, uh, as everyone else, we took the trains and subway everywhere. We used cars just on weekends just to kind of get away from the crowds, maybe to go to the mountains. But it's very efficient. You can take a train or a subway and pretty much get to within walking distance of anywhere in the entire city of Tokyo. And so um, one morning, I forget where I was going. I don't know if I was going to work or whatever, but I remember I was in a hurry. And I got out of the elevator from our apartment and we were close enough to the train station that I could run the entire way to the train station, go through the gates and get on the train without ever stopping uh, from within one um, stint. And so I needed to get that train. I wanted that 927 train, which is really silly because in Japan, every two minutes or every three minutes, there's another train. Like they constantly, are, and they're never late. So like if I missed that train, I would have had to wait at the most three minutes, maybe two minutes if it was rush hour. So anyways, I needed to get to that train. That's what I was thinking. So I was rushing. And there's one major street that I have to cross before I get to the train station. So I ran up there. The light was red, so I had to stop. And beside me waiting was an elderly woman and she was, you know, hunched over. She might have had like a shopping cart or a cane, but she wasn't, she was looking down and her posture was that way. So she was just like this. So I stopped and then I saw my moment. If you can imagine, uh, if you grew up in the 80s, you know, Frogger, you know, zipping in around cars. I thought, I'm fast enough. I see a, a little, I can r get over to the other side of the street and I can still catch that 927 train. So I started running across the street. And as I got halfway across, I realized what had happened. Because this elderly woman who was looking down, when she saw me go, she assumed that the light was green. It was okay to walk. So she started moving like this fast across the street. And I turned around and went, no, stop. And so I had to rush back and try to explain to her, but she went, she just kept going. And so all the cars screeched to a halt and as she slowly made her way across. And I just felt so dumb and embarrassed. And because I was in a hurry, I almost had this lady killed. Have you ever been in a situation where you're in a hurry and you just make dumb decisions or you hurt yourself or you hurt others? I think we can all admit that a lot of our worst um, behavior takes place when we're in a hurry. And so listen, hurry and love are not compatible. Look at these words from Jesus. These words, um, as he went along, he saw a man from birth. Other, other passages might say, as he was passing by. This is so common. Ministry happened for Jesus as he was passing by, as he was you know, walking by the lake. As he, was, uh, as he went along, someone approached him. Or as he was doing these things, he, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. Walking was Jesus' primary mode of transportation. And I love these words. Jesus was going slow enough that he could see. He saw a man who was, who was born blind from birth. Speed is such a, an important asset of our culture, right? We want faster internet. We want faster access. Uh, I just heard this week that the, the founder of Amazon may become the first trillionaire because especially during this coronavirus, we want things now. I don't want to wait till the mall opens to buy that hoodie or to buy that, that new sweater or to buy what it, we want things now, right? And so we are rewarding that. And Amazon, I, I love using Amazon. It's so convenient, but it's just a part of our, our culture, right? We, we, we eat fast food. And I know some of you say, oh, I never eat fast food. But you know what? That McDonald's in Southdale, every time I pass by, there's a lineup of cars at the drive-thru. So, I mean, we're doing it. We're constantly eating fast food because we want it quick. Microchips and computers, like I said, are getting faster and faster all the time. Life is done in a rush. Do you ever get to the end of your day and think, well, that was, that was a blur. I did so many things today. Well, but what did I actually do? Do you ever get to that point? John chapter 9. As he went along, this is as Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. And then he had compassion. Did you know love has a speed? How fast do you think love is? I'll tell you what the speed of love is. 
three miles per hour, roughly five kilometers an hour. Three miles per hour, that is the average walking speed of a human being. There's a Japanese theologian, his name is Koyama Kosuke, and he wrote a book called The Three Mile an Hour God. And in it, he said this, he says, love has its speed. It's an inner speed, it's a spiritual speed. It's a different kind of speed from the techno technological speed to which we are accustomed to. It is slow, yet it is Lord over all other speeds since it is the speed of love. God walks slowly because God is love. If he is not love, he probably would have gotten around much faster. And uh, Koyama Sensei says that in this book, he, he looks at Deuteronomy. And there, when, when the people of God have been rescued from slavery in Egypt, and they spend this time in the wilderness in Deuteronomy, God spends 40 years to teach his people one lesson. God is, is slow. God, God is patient. He takes 40 years to teach them that you do not live on bread alone, but on every mouth, on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The speed of love is walking pace. Even during that time in the wilderness, those 40 years, God was not absent. God was not far away. God was with his people. And those symbols of, of the, the pillar of fire and the cloud, those, God was with them. And he was walking along with them. God is present with us. And so we, we often talk to, we often ask about people's spiritual lives. And we might say, so how is your walk with God? Is that a common expression? Or, or you might say, um, how are your children doing? Oh, are they walking with God? We don't say, I, are they running with God? You know, hey, hey, how's your, how's your sprint with God going? We don't say that, do we? Somehow we know deep down that our relationship with God is a, a one that walks. We walk with God. We walk with Jesus. This a hurry and love are incompatible. Psychologists will tell you this, counselors will tell you this. It doesn't matter what, what faith background they have. If they are Christians, if they are atheists, if they are Buddhists or whatever, everyone knows that this speed of life is not good for our emotional health, our mental health. It is not good for our physical health. You know, one of the key words out there today is mindfulness, right? We need to slow down and, and they, they realize that it's good for you. So people will tell you for your own benefit, slow down. Now for us as followers of Jesus Christ, the, these are side benefits. We don't do these things in order that we may have a better life. We slow down so that we can love other people. That's our motivation. We want to be like God. We want to uh, exemplify God's character. And so, and so all these other things, they'll come along. They're good for us. Our mental health, our emotional health only benefits when we slow down. But we're not doing that so that we can have a better life. That comes as a side, side benefit. We do this so that we can show love and we can be loving to God and to other people. In fact, love, joy, peace. Those three often go together in the scripture. Love, joy, and peace. Some of the central teachings of Jesus Christ. Isn't, none of those are compatible with hurry. Can you, when you're rushed, do you feel you know, joyful? When you're scattered because you have so many things on your to-do list, are you peaceful? You see, it's not just love. Love, joy, and peace are all incompatible with hurry. Hey, I have um, a survey. Uh, and then we're going to look at uh, Jesus and look at his life and see how maybe he could teach us a thing or two. So just take, take a couple minutes, and it's going to be on the screen, and answer uh, according to the survey. Go ahead, just watch this survey for a couple minutes.
Well, how did you do on that survey? Hurry sickness, it's a thing, which didn't used to exist, but it does now. And everyone will tell us that it's something we need to be concerned about. Again, I just want to remind you for us, we're concerned about this because it limits our ability to love God and to love others. And all these other side benefits come with it. But our example always is Jesus Christ. Let me remind you of these words. Jesus says, uh, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. What a wonderful invitation, isn't it? This is from Matthew chapter 11. Jesus says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'd like you just imagine yourself being yoked together with Jesus. A yoke, you know, you, they're put on oxen to plow the fields, uh, maybe not today, but back in Jesus' day. And so you're paired with another ox. Your partner is Jesus. He's the experienced one. He's the strong one. And he will show you how to plow the field, how to get the work done. And you'll follow his lead. You won't be running ahead. You won't be running to the side. You'll just allow him to do the heavy work as you learn and you go along with him. Remember, Jesus is walking. And Jesus was, Jesus was never in a hurry. Can you remember anything from Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or John? Any story of Jesus where he was rushed? Or when he was in a hurry? Jesus was never in a hurry. In Luke chapter 5, verse 16, Luke describes a little bit of Jesus. Like he gives us a little bit of insight. He says, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Often. If you have your Bibles open, underline that or highlight it. It says, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. And as you read about Jesus' life, you will see that over and over again. Jesus is getting away. He is disengaging. He's getting away from the crowds. There's lots of ministry to be done, but Jesus often went away to a lonely place by himself and he prayed. So I like to go through some of these scenarios. I've, I've marked my Bible up a little bit. And you know, um, my Bible has uh, red, red print and black print. Uh, in the Gospels. Maybe yours does too. It's a red letter edition Bible. And the red letters are, are there because this is what we believe. These are Jesus' words. And so they're highlighted in red. But uh, someone has once said that, I wish, I wish we had green letter Bibles as well. What would the, the red letters are, the words Jesus spoke, what would the green letters, you know, signify? And he said, this would be like, go. Green, green lights mean go. Green would be um, all of the things that Jesus did. And if those were to be highlighted in green, then we could see all of, the, all of his practices, his behaviors. And as we um, are yoked together with Jesus, we want to be doing the things that he's doing all in the entirety of his life, not just in those high points. And so we could go through, and maybe you want to try that, get a green highlighter or an underliner and go through the, the Gospels and green the things that Jesus was doing. And you'll see over and over again, something like this. Jesus often withdrew by himself to a place to get alone, to pray. So let me go through some of these uh, with you. If you have your Bibles or you want to use the Bible tab down below on the screen. Uh, first, we'll look at uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 35 to verse 37. Mark chapter 1, verse 35 to 37. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him and they found him. They explained, hey, everyone is looking for you. And here we see Jesus being very intentional uh, about his time with God the Father. He was doing this on purpose. And if you look at the context a little bit, you see he had just had a really busy day. Healing people, uh, exercise. It says that the whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many uh, who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons and he wouldn't let the demons speak because uh, they knew who he was. And he just, you know, healed uh, Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. And so, I mean, 
that sounds exhausting. And so after a busy day, wouldn't you just want to sleep in a little bit? And you, I just, I'm, ex I'm tired, right? But Jesus realized that the source of his energy comes from his relationship with his Father in heaven. And so it says, while it was still dark, very early in the morning, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a solitary place where he prayed. But his, his followers, his closest companions, didn't get it. They interrupted him. They're like, hey, wait, what are you doing? People are looking for you. Come on, we've got lots to do. We've got to get going. But here we see Jesus be very intentional. Next, let's just uh, skip over to Luke chapter 4. And we're just going to do this just for a little bit. Of all these places where Jesus often, because, you know, Luke says often. So let's see how often it really is. Luke chapter 4, verses 40, verse 42. Again, at daybreak. Okay, so in the morning, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him. And when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. At daybreak, it says, verse 42, Jesus went to a solitary place. You know, often when we talk about following Jesus, we talk about uh, maybe his morals, um, behaviors like um, don't do this or, or do that. We think about moral issues maybe, or, or maybe we think of his teachings, you know, what he, what he taught. But as I just mentioned earlier, what about the green letters? I know the green letter Bible doesn't exist, or maybe it does. What about the things that Jesus did in, in, in the entirety of his life? Would, would following Jesus not entail following him in, in those times too? And so following like his, his rhythm of life. Part of uh, Jesus, not part of, but Jesus' strength came from his relationship with his Father in heaven. And so he knew that that was important for him. And that was where he was refreshed and strengthened and able to do all that he can do. And so it's like us trying you know, to be like Michael Jordan by wearing his shoes without going through the entire life process of whatever. So we see Jesus is, we want to be like him, but we need to follow his, the rhythm uh, of his life. Just, we're also, we're Luke, just look at Luke chapter 5, verse 16. You can skip over a little bit there. Luke chapter 5, verse 16, it uh, says right here, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Just right there before in verse 15, it says, The news about him spread all the more. So the crowds are getting bigger now. Crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. So Jesus healed them? No, he, he often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. I wonder what that would be like if, if Luke were to describe my life. You know, but Joel often withdrew to lonely... What do you, I'm, I'm not sure, we, but Joel, uh, you know, occasionally would um, get away by himself or, you know, here and there, every now and then, sometimes, rarely. What, what word would he use? To, maybe we're getting a little bit personal here, aren't we? But this is how, how Luke described what Jesus did. Jesus often did this. Do you ever, so these are early morning episodes, but Jesus didn't always use the early morning. Um, what keeps Jesus up at night? Sometimes he stayed up late at night. Let's look at Mark chapter 6, verses 45. If you can't keep up with these references, they're in the notes. You can check the Bible notes there. Mark chapter 6, verses 45 to 47. Immediately, okay, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Beth Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake while he was alone on land. Again, we see Jesus at nighttime now. Something that is, uh, I wonder what keeps Jesus up at night. I know it keeps me up at night. Right? We, sometimes I, I'm, I think about things I said to someone or maybe an email I wrote, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And I worry or I fret. Uh, things that are causing me anxiety, or, um, you know, I don't know if it's the same way, but have you ever, you know, stayed up past midnight um, waiting for your next, for your, your binge episode to, the, the series, the next season of your, whatever you're binge watching to be released, because it gets released the next day, or, or maybe those episodes that get released by, so you want to stay up and be the first one. Do you ever do that? Does that keep you up at night? Yeah, me neither. I don't do that either. 
But here's some things that keep Jesus up at night. Also, Luke chapter 6, verses, sometimes we get personal, I can just kind of read the Bible and move along. And people forget these things. Luke chapter 6, verses 12 to 13. It says, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night. He spent the night praying to God. This is what was keeping Jesus up all night. It says, verse, keep reading, Luke chapter 6, verse 12, but then verse 13. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and he chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. This is what kept Jesus up at night. He knew he was going to be choosing his inner uh, core of people, the people he was going to be calling the apostles, the, the 12. And so what would you do you know, if you were entrusted or if you were asked to choose something like this, the 12 people that are going to follow you and change the entire course of history and change the world? Would you stay up all night praying? Yeah, maybe me neither. Like I'd look at resumes. I'd be asking um, people for uh, references maybe of weighing pros and cons. And of course, I'd pray a little bit, but this is what Jesus did. He spent the entire night praying, knowing that this was the decision he needed to make in close relationship with his father. Can you imagine, what, what would that have been like? Do you think if Jesus stayed up all night, was he just talking? Was he like just a one-way conversation, is rambling and talking and speaking? Because it was all, he didn't sleep. I imagine that's probably not what happened. I imagine it's more of a conversation, maybe a give and take and talking and then listening and hearing his father speak and then talking back at the conversational type prayer. And in the morning, he was ready to make this big decision. I mean, there's so many examples. Do you remember when, he, when Jesus received the news of uh, John the Baptist, how um, Jesus heard you know, he was killed? When Jesus heard what had happened, um, it says in Matthew chapter 14 that he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. There's another example. After feeding 5,000 people, you remember that story? Jesus made his disciples leave. Then he dismissed the crowd. And after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Do you remember when Jesus found out about Lazarus? It just said in, in, in um, John chapter 11, it says Lazarus was one of the people Jesus loved. And when he heard about what had happened, how Lazarus had, Lazarus had died, John chapter 11, verse 6, it says, Jesus stayed there for two more days. Jesus was never in a hurry. He didn't rush. He was calm and relaxed and not in here. I mean, I could go on. There's so many. Okay, let's, let's go on. Just a little bit more, a couple more. Mark chapter 6, verse 31 and 32. In Mark chapter 6, verse 31 and 32, it says this. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, he said to his, his followers, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Jesus invited his followers in the midst of a, a busy schedule, in the midst of this exhausting and tiring schedule to, to just get away. And he did this often, just to be quiet, a quiet place, restful place, where they could spend some time in communion with their Father in heaven. In Matthew chapter 26, the Garden of Gethsemane, as Jesus was preparing for his most holy work, his highest calling, Jesus sought the solitude of the Garden of Gethsemane. The priority of Jesus the priority that Jesus made of, of silence and solitude, and it's everywhere in the Gospels. It's part of his entire lifestyle. And we want to be more, I mean, if we could all be like miniature Jesuses, this world would be a different place. We want to love God. We want to love others. Because we know that if we did that and if everyone did that, this would be an entirely different world. But in order to do that, Jesus is showing us the, the secret, right, to his easy yoke. Follow me. He says, do what I do. If Jesus felt the importance and the necessity to get away over and over and over again, to find some silence, to get away from the busyness and spend some time with his Father in heaven, then how much more do you think we need to be doing that? This is how Jesus made important decisions. It's how he started his ministry in the wilderness for 40 days, right? As after his baptism, he took his time. It's how he 
It's how he taught uh, his disciples. It's how he prepared for important ministry events. It's how he prepared to die on the cross. Jesus did this over and over again. So I would like to encourage us, and again, I'm always speaking to myself as well, to let's imitate Jesus a little bit more over these next few weeks. Maybe the coronavirus is giving us some time to slow down because we don't have dance classes or, or music lessons or sports activities, or, th or sometimes we just can't go to the stores because they're closed earlier. Maybe we have a little bit of time. Let's take advantage of that. You know, every year, two, two to three times a year at Cornerstone Alliance Church, we offer a Hearing God workshop. And so there'll be another one coming up in the fall. Maybe you would consider just taking that, just taking six weeks, one night a week, um, to develop these patterns of constantly hearing and listening to God speak into your life. There's a tab on our website. Um, go there to cornerstonealliance.church, click on the Pray tab, and there are some resources there to help you set up um, a daily prayer time, a daily quiet time, a daily devotional time. And maybe you, you have a daily time already. Sometimes our routines can get a little dry. You could try something new or try something different. So please go there and look at these resources. You see, the answer isn't simply more time. It's not like if we had eight days in the week or 50 hours in a day, it would be so much more relaxing because we would just fill those with other things and technology gets faster and faster and demands more and more of us. The answer is Jesus' easy yoke. He says his yoke is easy. Yoke means we're still working. There's work to be done, but it's how you accomplish the work. Be yoked with Jesus. With Jesus. His yoke is easy and his burden is life. Try, light. Try, to, try to imagine what that might be like. Try to imagine what our church community might be like if, if no one was ever rushed or hurried, if we'd all spent time with our Father in heaven daily, and if there's things that, that we were making decisions but we would pray together. Just imagine how much more we can love each other, how much love we would be poured into our relationship with God. Do you think our community might be a little more loving? Do you think our, our cities, our neighborhoods would be affected by this? Can you imagine what that might be like? Listen, I'd like to close uh, with a prayer. And I'm going to put it up on the screen. And then you can follow along with me if you'd like to pray this prayer with you wherever you are. And, and then we'll close. Um, after This will be our closing prayer. So if you'd like to, uh, the words are up on the screen. And uh, let's repeat this prayer together. If you don't want to repeat it, it's fine. You can do it louder inside your head. Let's pray this prayer together. Jesus, I long to live in loving communion with the Father like you did in your earthly life and as you do now. Slow me down from all my self-defined God projects that keep me from listening well to the voice of the one who says both, I love you and I send you. Amen. Well, I hope you're able to pray that prayer. I know God will answer your prayer. In James, it says to come near to God and he will come near to you. <laughs> Folks, it's time for us to slow down a little bit. It's time for us to unclutter our lives and fill that with time to develop our relationship with Jesus, with our Father in heaven. Thanks for joining us today. We're not done yet. Let me just uh, um, invite you to give Thankful, thank you so much for your generosity in giving to the church during this time. And here's an opportunity now for you to give. Some instructions will be on the screen. And then when it comes back, I just want to pray once more with you. Thanks for joining us for the online church service. We want to invite you to join our lobby afterwards. When, our, when we are in our building, when we have been in the building before this happened, we would often congregate. Some of us would drink coffee. Some of us would go to the gym. 
and we would just hang out for a little bit. And sometimes people stayed for an hour after the service. And so we're sort of reproducing that here in an online uh, setting. And so if you'd like to just hang out in the lobby for one minute or two minutes or five minutes or a little more, there's a link in the notes. Please click on the link and uh, we'll have a video uh, lobby time. We'd love to see your faces and to uh, just to chat and get caught up a little bit. And even if you're new and if you haven't been to our church, uh, the building, uh, you're welcome to join as well. And we would love to see you and meet you and introduce, introduce ourselves to you as well. So as I close, uh, I would like to just pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you for being so gracious and compassionate and patient. Thank you for always being loving. You are slow to anger. You are rich in goodness. And we thank you for all of these things. Lord, I pray that you would help us to spend time with you Help us to be re-energized and refreshed when we sit down and meditate and memorize scripture and just let your love soak, um, as, let ourselves soak in your love. Help us find the time and the motivation just to be with you, not because we feel we have to or we feel guilty, but just because we want to. Give us that desire, I pray. And Lord, some of us right now are feeling extra lonely, lonelier than normal because of the social distancing rules that are in place. So Lord, would you come and please be with these people uh, in their homes, um, in hospital rooms, uh, wherever they are, and fill them with your presence. Let them know that you have not forgotten, we have not forgotten, and give everybody a little extra oomph to get through uh, to the next stage. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children.